que captura la pantalla. Eso es lo que me asegura. Introduction to microcontrollers, I call it, and so we're going to cover basic topics related to what a computer is, how we write code for computers, what what differentiates a computer from a microcontroller, uh, why it's writing a timer versus writing a numeric system, um, how do I put the thing I drive into a chip, and at the end, all these give us an idea of why this week we need to create something which is called a tab ISC. Right? That, that's the, the biggest thing we want to answer is this one today. Okay, so first of all, uh, because it's important to get the idea uh, we are talking about computing and not computers. Because uh, when we think about computers, we think of desktops, we think of the servers, right? Uh, and, and computers are much more than this, okay? So, something that Top Academy should help us is to understand that 
could be that adding um, logic to a prop and to our um, uh, projects, adding something that it brings an input, performs an operation, gives you an output. It's not something that can just be done on a computer, as in a laptop and servers. It can be done in many other ways. Um, another one. Look, uh, computers is not about binary one to zero. It's not about serial. I mean, we use that because they are convenient. Okay, it's easier to represent uh, two states, yes, no, electricity or no electricity, than representing ten states. Okay. And it's also, um, we do it in silicon because we found that that's, uh, that's, it's, it's a good semiconductor uh, and, and in fact we, we realize that building semiconductors is the, the best way to do it nowadays before we go about. But there's several ways to do things, okay? And it's important for Valve Academy that all these um, inputs, um, uh, yeah, there's all these inputs that you are receiving from, from Neil about many ideas about how you build a computer and what's computing and what's not. Um, it's true that many times you say, why is he explaining as that things? If my work here is about doing a small PCB with a, an Arduino inside that's going to read an input and do an output. But getting this framework, it's, it's really powerful in the future how you think, okay? And you'll see it in a moment. In fact, um, for example, just to, to, to be clear, I mean, like computers don't even need to be uh, digital. I mean, if you look at the history of computers, uh, you'll see that the first computers were not even digital. So they represent things uh, on a continuous medium. And later, later we can we can have a look about it. Um, in fact, I think learning the core principles about computing should help us to create. And since many of you, uh, I, I think for what Sandy told me, you come more from a creative world, right? Uh, so it's, it's important to think that all these core concepts, uh, it's true that exploring them from a technical point of view, we won't be able to do it. I mean, um, Maybe some of you are not writing your own compiler or creating a new computer architecture, but that's not the point. I mean, that, that requires a lot of uh, research in a very specific field. Um, but learning the, the core principles, learning um, what a computer architecture is, uh, the same as learning how the internet works. It's not about writing the internet, but it's about getting those ideas that allow us to think that if uh, things are inventing the way, um, it's because someone decided that way, but then we can also uh, ring them things. Okay. And that's really, really important. Here, um, I, I, read, I read a book uh, some uh, like uh, two years ago, which is, uh, it's, I really would like to recommend you on this kind of uh, set. It's called The Innovators, and it's a really like uh, bestseller book that basically describes uh, a little bit the, the biography of the pioneers of the digital age. So it starts with other documents, um, and it goes into Turing, and then it goes into Google Founders, and Microsoft, and Apple, all those guys. And so I really recommend you to have a read at some of the chapters of this book because if you like it give you an overview of these core principles on the way we see it read. It's not like getting this book like the principles of computer science, you know, it's something much more um, easier to follow. And also it's it's really focused on who did it, so it's more a biographical point of view. But it really helped me to get this point, right? That sometimes understanding the core principles, uh, even if you are not an engineer working specifically on computers or microprocessors and um, things that are really on, on, the, on a deep level, it, it helps. So, um, then you see that um, something that, I mean, even there's all this complexity around us, okay? Uh, even if uh, when we are explaining things, you'll see um, how complex and how many levels do they have. When we're going to uh, do our own projects, um, luckily, uh, the whole um, somehow um, like centralization and this makes things uh, cheaper and faster and more efficient and this means that at the end what you're going to be uh, uh, doing it's mostly going you're going to rely on, on, on a framework which is pretty well defined right uh, most of the work that we'll do in microcontroller and the top academy it's going to be based around uh, Arduino or Arduino families right in the sense that even sometimes if we are not writing directly code on Arduino, we are writing directly C++, uh, it's going all to be related to that field. So the centralization helps. The same that you all mostly will be writing um, software um, when it's not going to be on microcontrollers using your computers. So you are going to be using quite a standard framework. Um, but it's, as I said, it's important to keep um, this more broader idea. So, uh, um, in fact, um, I recommend you really as a way to understand how things work and, 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 and to start realizing that most of the technology that we have around us inside look the same by visiting the, this site called iFixit. You know iFixit? 
iFixit is a, is a website where there um, it's So if you search on iFixit for teardowns, these guys, I mean, they're not the only ones, but it's one where there's many things. Aside from providing manuals about how to repair things, they take things apart. And uh, I think a really nice way to learn many of the things that we are talking about is by looking how an icon works inside, how an icon works inside, how wearable gadgets as uh, you know these Nike uh, things you can wear, how uh, digital watches like this kind of digital smart watches work, uh, how I mean because you see at the end that most of the things they work the same. Uh, mostly you see that that all they because things are mostly digital. We we'll talk about what, what this means nowadays, how this is used. You'll see they all have the same part inside. You'll see there's some sort of computer always inside. And information that is captured by analog sensors, like for example, um, a noise sensor, a sound, microphone, right? Uh, it's then turned into a digital and it's processed inside, and then we do uh, some output that might be analog, but we turn to analog again. In the case that if things happen on the digital wall, and we'll see in a moment what this means, uh, you'll see that um, most of the time uh, there's just something called a small computer, which mostly it's a microcontroller or sometimes it's a full uh, fledged computer. Okay? But I really recommend you to do so and it teaches me a lot to look how things are made inside, but not to realize the complexity of the world, so to realize the opposite. To realize that um, things uh, nowadays they tend to look all inside the same. And then it's just about designers making them nice uh, shapes, but, but it, really, it really happens a lot uh, like this. This was in the same, this was like this 25 years ago. And, um, and this is really one of the powers of, of, um, of, uh, of the digital revolution. And we will see in a moment in what, what I'm talking about. So if, 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 if you open a device that may be 25 years old, uh, or even more, you'll see inside uh, they are um, mostly uh, animals. So if you open a video tape recorder, you'll see that it looks uh, really different than a DVD recorder. Um, and this mostly it's because the DVD it's, works fully digitally, so it just gets the data from from optic disk processing and then at the end turn it into uh, into a uh, video signal, but all this processing inside is not digitally. So basically turning ones and zeros from the DVD uh, lights and then processing those ones and zeros and getting those uh, long lists of numbers, counting the long of numbers, it, it decodes as MPEG and then that's all the processing and then that's you know creating an RGB image uh, 25 uh, frames per second and, and turning into into analog maybe. But we'll see um, that uh, because all process is digital, right? It looks the same as, as it, it, when you look at it, as it looks to the future, and it still looks many digital appliances. Why on the video tape? Because all the process was in analog, so you will have um, these um, different uh, magnetic encodings of the tape that you were reading and turning into a video signal. And all this process was not using ones and zeros, was using continuous uh, signaling path. Uh, you'll see that then inside each device will really be something, right? And, and, and really encourage you to do it. Looking at teardowns, all teardowns, big teardowns, it's a really good way of learning and, and making sense about what our academy is, at least in terms of electronics. So, sorry, you can what gallons are there? Downs, you understand? Yeah, teardowns, yeah. Oh, teardowns, yeah. Right, sorry, okay. right, yeah. yeah. So, and, and I recommend you to say, you can look at this with turndowns, but any turndowns work fine. Okay. There's another site which I recommend you for for many other things related to Fab Academy. It's that's, that's more, uh, let's say, um, a site related to a learning electronics, which is called Hackaday. And in Hackaday, they also do really good turndowns, okay? And there's also a lot of videos about them. But um, I'm not telling you, as, oh, let's look at this site. You, know, you can learn a lot by looking how things are made. And it makes a sense that um, things are more feasible now. Sometimes when we talk about computers, things look really abstract. And that's uh, making it difficult for us to understand what's going on. Well, just now that we are here, as we are saying, as you see, the word digital is getting important, right? And so um, we can talk for ages about digital. And I'm not like, here uh, some one expert on digital and information theory, etc. But just for you to give you a quick overview. Um, for sure, you already know this a little bit. Uh, but it's always good to give you a quick look so we don't 
um, somehow agree on the same principles. There is many ways of talking about digital, but one that um, it's easier to, to, to understand, I think, it's look, here we have a continuous, um, a continuous flow of information. Let's imagine that this wave maybe is um, a sound okay, coming from recording, right? Uh, so as you know, um, when we talk, um, we generate, or when we see more things, you know, we generate frequencies, uh, and uh, basically among those frequencies, so they, they can have a different amplitude, right? So um, we look at this, and so this will be, uh, this will be um, the frequency, right? Um, so sorry, this will be the amplitude, and this will be um, the time. And so um, when we look at um, when we look at this, um, at this uh, we see a continuous waveform, right, coming out from this. And so the first thing we do, if the thing is digital, is that um, we're going to quantify it. So a computer cannot understand it, and digital world can understand something that's continuous like this, because it doesn't work in a continuous manner. So even though when we listen to music coming from a digital player, it feels to us that the music is continuous. For a computer, there are no things that are continuous like this. We present things in time, assessing in batches, okay? So the uh, first thing we need to do is to cut the wave, right? And we'll mostly make it easier, and make like to cut it always at the same interval, right? So once we had this um, cut, um, <clears throat> what we want to, what basically the information that we can store on these time frames, right, would be this point here, and this point here, and this point here, and this point here, right? And so, and so as you see at the end, um, with what we end up, it's basically, um, we cut the wave um, uh, vertically. But that's not enough. Uh, that's not enough because at the same we want uh, an infinite number of intervals into the time domain, right? We also want them at the frequency domain. So you see that we also cut it the wave horizontally like this. This means now that it's not just that we will be always reading at this point, this point, this point, this point. It means also that when we read, for example, at this point here, okay, you see the mouse, um, we cannot bring the red point here up as we were doing here. No, 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 no. Because we split it this into, into these three units. So it's like like a race. So we need to get the one which is closer, which is this one here. So if you think what digital at the end means, it's mostly about the idea that things are discrete. So there is a limited number of possibilities something would have. Okay. And it's just simply this idea. And how many possibilities do I want to have? Well, as many I need <coughs> to represent something. So if I just want to create a code to communicate a green part that we have about if it's sunny or um, or cloudy inside, and I know that when it's sunny it cannot be cloudy. I can just decide and look, I just see, and, and only symbols represent that, right? It's like, it's like, look, John, every day you go up in the house, and if it's sunny, you basically show a flag. And if it's not, you don't show a flag. Okay, that's fine. I don't need any more things to just know. The problem is that if suddenly it can be sunny and cloudy the same day, so this maybe doesn't work, but it can be rainy and sunny at the same day, then the things, it's not enough just to show the flag, right? Then, so basically, it's about defining the number of possibilities I need to account, right? In, in, in this case, how many possibilities do I want? Well, uh, it, it depends uh, in uh, the amount, let's say, the quality of what you listen to music. With, you know? So um, usually on a CD record, I think it's uh, 16 bits, um, which um, basically equals how uh, to the calculation to uh, around uh, 60 bits, uh, it's around, uh, yeah, it's around 64,000, uh, it's around 64,000 possibilities. Um, so, um, and the number of bits, that would be the number of rectangles uh, that is fall, that I have, okay? So, um, Okay, but so for me the most important thing today, or right to that, is not to do a whole conference about digital um, and analog systems, but it's to give you these kind of quick overviews, okay? So, um, 
what's really cool when we have digital tools, that, that's what's cool about computers, and that's what's cool about digital uh, um, electronics, which is possibly what we will be doing with Club Academy. It is just that, look, when you turn things into digital, okay, um, as you realize, you basically have now things defined by a, a, a discrete form, which means that I can represent the things using numbers, and, and then that means that it looks the same feature, that it looks a video, that it looks a noise, that it looks any information or text, right? And that really changed the way we think about things, and in fact that Neil explained, I uh, guess, in the first class, uh, um, why, I mean, much more uh, that I'm doing now, which is, um, look, um, this is the Pony Express, this was the mail service between the, the east and west coast of the United States of the 19th century, and suddenly the telegram arrived. Look, uh, these men carrying, uh, was carrying Oscars with his horse, but if you suddenly want him to carry something different, well, you need maybe to in the whole system, because maybe the horse cannot carry, you know, like, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's limited to what the horse can carry, right? And, and the whole infrastructure design around, and envelopes, you know? The whole system is designed just to support things on paper. Um, while the telegraph, right? I mean, it's true that um, if we think of the telegraph specifically, but also mostly at the usage just for sending characters, because the speed was not uh, that much. Um, but um, it's true that we can encode the information. In fact, over this wire, we can send any sort of information, and we can see images. That's what happens with the internet, right? We don't think that the internet would be to a stream video. I mean, this thing was just to send plain text emails and some web pages. But thanks to we can turn things you want to consider, then suddenly uh, we could um, start sending videos and create YouTube on top of that. And the same is for computers. We kind of needed to, to change uh, the way computers work in order to create a new application. Okay? So that's why it's, that's why it's important to think about these electronics. Yeah, I think we can understand how analogous might be the data. Right. And we don't spend, like, uh, okay, if you make a constant. Uh, so you can't be able to discrete the meaning with the yes. screen this. But still, uh, you can only use a few characters, or maybe or just two characters, zero and one, or I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so how all those thousands of possibilities are translated into the So there thousands of possibilities. Um, they are true to a number, and you get perfectly through this point. In fact, you don't have any insight in the way you're getting it. You get into a number, and then you need to turn this number uh, well, totally different, but then this number, it's not being represented as a number that we have in our head that maybe we can say 10,000, so you think of one and zeros. It's represented not decimal, but binary, which means that it's yes, no states. But at the end, it's the same. So imagine a long range sequence, right? Um, where um, I can say, say um, on or off, okay? And on this long range of switches, uh, I get each of these are states, right? And I represent it by turning on and off the switches. How I represent it? Well, I encode it in binary. So to encode a number in binary, basically it consists about um, getting close and answering the same question I was saying before. Um, which uh, somehow we can think about as saying, uh, look, it is, if, if you just want to know if it's 0 or 1, uh, you just need to see the line. Wow. But if you want to count a key, then uh, you need two bytes, right? Because you want to do, uh, you want to do, uh, it's zero, it's one, right? And then you want to do, it's two, and then it's three, right? So that's, that's the way, that's the way uh, you count. So really this mechanism, you can have as many switches as you need, right? To fit the number that you decided. And those switches will be turned on and off, right? And this will represent the state. And all the operations at the end will be doing in this, in this way. So we'll be getting these on and off switches, and then we'll basically compare them. Um, so like comparing them, we can also add them on top of each other. So this will be more thinking about how this whole system works, which I don't want to go that much in detail. But I don't know if these are in detail. Like we turn the numbers into this, right? And then, as you can see, the switches, they represent a value, and they can represent a value of video, of recording, of whatever. Uh, so the number of characters yeah. which you need depends on the number of possibilities that we Exactly, exactly. And the possibilities um, are defined by us because we can consider the nature as infinite possibilities. So if we look at this way, how many possibilities does this way have? Well, it has infinite possibilities. I mean, maybe there's uh, someone who can really differentiate about 
these super two small, uh, you know, details. But we decide and that's conventions. It's our conventions. I mean, the same, and, and we see them happening all the time. I mean, on, on music, it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate sometimes. But we we see, well, we keep increasing the number of possibilities, and we just uh, get a little better. It's like people also argue that MP3s have a lower quality of sound that we're exactly. getting, we get used to, but people more fanatic about sound and say, no, vinyls and LPs exactly. because you have a much more accurate yeah. representation of the sound wave. So it's much more Correct. Better. Well, because they say that when you discretize something when you turn it into digital, of course, and we can see here, we are losing some information, right? The problem is how much interesting is this information? And many times that we realize that what we lose into this process is far less than what we lose through an analog system. Because the good thing about having a process like this, uh, and that, that's a whole field, but I, 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 I will show you later a few videos that will explore that topic. But um, look, um, let's imagine that um, someone sent us this, okay, sent us a red line uh, by email, and, okay, and then we need to recover, uh, okay, the, the analog flow. So look, the cool thing about digital is that if I know that this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, so we have these seven possibilities here, right? And on my on my let's let's imagine it's not email, it's visual one, okay. And so there's an stain here, and I don't see really if this point is here or it's here. Well, I don't care, because I'm just going to choose the one which is closer to here or to there, and that's fine. So you see that someone can send me information which is not complete, right? It's missing something, but I can't recover it. Because it's like a prime read of something. It's like if someone, right, send you a drawing that the lines are not perfect on your line, but then you apply your recall job and say, oh, like perfect, yeah, keep your secret. Okay, of course, there's a limit to that process, but that's one of the beauties of that. So if you like these topics, um, I'll suggest you, um, I will send it on the list of links later, I don't want to keep opening, but there's there's a few videos about, uh, in Khan Academy, about uh, what's called information theory, which are really good. Uh, and then there's another channel on YouTube called Computer File, which is also uh, not for all the videos, uh, I mean maybe some are, are not what we're talking about, but there's some also one video about information theory. And this is something the new version for like the last year, you, you mentioned it. Um, you like it. Okay, so um, now a little bit with the as you can see what's analog and what's digital. And for you to understand, most of the academy will be always doing digital electronics. Digital electronics means that if we want to uh, read a sensor, right, and we want to activate that sensor, uh, what we are going to do is read the voltage coming out from that sensor. Um, maybe it's a voltage, maybe the sensor already talks to us in a digital way. And we're going to feed this into a microcontroller that we'll see in a moment deeper what they are. So we'll feed this into a computer, we can call it. A microcontroller, an insulator, which is a subset of a computer. So we'll feed this information into, the, into this computer. The computer will turn into something digital. We'll do some logic, basic one, and say, look, if there's no light, turn on, uh, turn on uh, this LED, this light, okay? And this logic, we're going to code inside the computer, right? So it's not that we're going to be placing components like, oh, if the light is lower than this, and physically on hardware, we replace a component to a to eight and to the other thing, right? Um, we'll be doing all these things into microcontrollers. Uh, and you see that's important because sometimes it happens when you are thinking of how you design electronics, that you want to follow the other way, which is good too, but it's much more simpler. Uh, to do things fully digital, at least for, for, for beginners as, as we are. And so, uh, I'm jumping from topic to topic, but so we keep very fine things. Um, in hardware, okay, let's think for a moment about hardware. Well, that's about ISP, right? Uh, yesterday class was about this thing, right? So, um, the, um, the FAP ISP, right, let me know we'll talk about what it does, but that's not the point right now. The point right now is to understand a little bit how the electronics that we are going to build in day four, right? So, um, as you can see, um, basically, um, the thing that seems like really fancy, like let's make PCBs, it's just like wiring things, you know? I mean, at the end, uh, what we have here is a bunch of components, right? Um, and we need to connect them together. And so we found a convenient way, which is to make 
PCBs, which basically means that we'll do a drawing of where all the components go. We'll connect components with components, so this goes there and that goes there, and then we'll place the components on top and we'll fix them. Uh, the same thing that we do at home when we wire for electrical installation. I look. So I need a wire to go from the meter to the fridge, a one from the, uh, from the meter to the washing machine, uh, and one from the meter to a switch and from the switch to the lights, right? So um, that's the same concept. There's, there's, there's nothing there that should um, make us think that these things are more complex or magic. It's simply, simply like that. However, um, when we look at compact circuits like this, many times we'll see there's two different shapes kind of components. Ones are um, what's mostly called, um, well, they're, well, I can use this word. Um, ones we can say they are um, simple electronic components. I use the word, let's use the word simple for now, okay, it's, it's easier. Uh, these might be resistor, capacitors, and I think that we're going to their how they work, right? And what do they do? But most of the time, since we are doing digital electronics in public academy, as I explained, we'll, be, we'll have, and that will be the core of all our things, we'll have a small computer, which is sitting here, okay? Every time that you see something like this, it, you shouldn't think that that's a computer. And you shouldn't think that that black box is different from the rest of the circuit. Uh, basically, this works on the following way. So, computers before um, and electronics before were just done by placing, let's go back a moment, simple components as the one you have here. So you were connecting components one with the others, right? Uh, at the beginning, even without using PCBs, because PCBs have been invented on the, on the 40s, there were different techniques. Uh, they look a little bit like PCBs, but they were not exactly PCBs. And even before that, just simple wires, okay? But there was a point that they realized that um, there, were, there were certain functionalities that they were replicating really often, and they wanted to miniaturize things. They said, look, if we are doing always the same design, if every time that we want to do a FAB ISP, we need to place these, these, and the other components together. <coughs> Why do we not design a process which makes the thing um, easier to produce and smaller to produce? And they realized that instead of building the things uh, onto separate components and then physically, mechanically, we assemble. There was a way that we can get silicium, we can get the same thing that was inside transistors, uh, but we can get a sheet of that and using the right process, right, um, we could basically put a lot of transistors together and a lot of other components. So resistors, transistors, we can make them from a single sheet of silicium just by applying different kinds of light on top of it. So imagine that you have the capability of getting a video projector and throwing light against a piece of uh, wood, and then the wood will suddenly be cut or divorced. In fact, we don't use light for that, but we do it. We do it with many machines, right? We place a piece, we place a piece of wood, right? And we can cut it, divorce it, do all these different features. And, and we can make a chair without anything else and a bit of wood, if you stress it, right? We learn this with, with laser cutting, for example. We can create super complex structures just by using this process. So, I don't want to go that much on that, but simply, um, they, they found that it was possible using silicium and this process with light to create um, circuits all at once, right? So, I have a piece of silicium, which is this. I place this um, light process on top, and I can create as many transistors as I want. Of course, first I'll need to design it, I should design it on circuits, it's not magic. I need to design it. So all these black boxes that you see around, they are all designed as electronics are designed. I mean, usually what happens, we have 40,000 transistors inside, you have 7 million transistors inside, uh, whatever number of transistors, you don't want to draw one by one, so you somehow automate things. You have to say, look, um, and basically here are uh, 1,500 blocks that they have this amount of transistors and so on. Um, in fact, you don't even do it drawing, they usually code them. Uh, because it's easier to describe things with code, you know? like, look, repeat the thing that many times, right? But that's not the topic of today. The topic of today is mostly that a fab ISP and any computer that we see around somehow, we could build it theoretically, 
with this, with, with, by, by using this component. You know? We could start by just using transistors and resistors and placing them one solver close to the others, right? But then suddenly we say, look, for things that um, we can, uh, that we use a lot, it's cheaper and more efficient to make and put them inside um, a black box, right? And so they always do this functionality. And we do this functionality through this process um, here. This, what we see here, to really get an idea, is uh, it's what we look inside of an Omega 328, which is the chip that you'll be using many times here with the DRD chip. However, not always that you see a black box like this or like this. It means that this is a computer. It means that this is a microcontroller. It could be other things. It could even be an analog component, right? You, you find integrated circuits like this, that for example, they combine a bunch of transistors to do an amplifier, something that gets a, a, a signal, a voltage signal, which is really low, and makes it bigger, so you can run a bit speaker, right? Uh, they just decided to do the same process because they need this um, component a lot, so it's cheaper to do this process, right? That's important because if not, when you look at PCBs, you get a little bit of confusion about what they are and what they do, right? Um, in fact, and I was explaining before, uh, even computers at some point were completely new using separate components. So um, that's, a, that's an ad from the IBM 7070, which one of the coolest things uh, it had, which is from the 1958, is that it was designed around these boards. Uh, so each board was doing a different functionality, and if you look onto the boards, you'll see there's no integrated circuits, there's no black boxes inside, you see? They're just like resistors and transistors and things like that. So even computers in the early time were built just off of parts, solar ones close to the other. Okay. Um, and in fact, just curiosity, one of the one of the, the let's say the first computers that used this idea of integrated circuits, right? Those idea of getting a bunch of components and need to do um, a certain precise functionality and placing them on a small box, let's say. Uh, was the Apollo computer, so the, 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 the computer allowed the astronauts to land to the moon. Um, quite well, because it was one of the first times that there was a requirement of building a super small computer, right? Not a computer the size of a room. And so, um, and just to finalize this, uh, back here, so to clarify even a little bit more this idea, um, think that here inside, I can place a wall computer, I can play just some part of a computer, and I can play something which is not a computer that is not even digital. That's only really analog as an amplifier. Okay? Uh, that's important when you look at circuits and so, so you get familiar with these ideas. Why still I need to place those components around? Well, we need to still place those components around because the chip here wasn't designed to be the top IDC chip, was designed to be a more general chip. So I need to adapt it to my, into my, into my uh, functionality. And to do so, what I'm doing here is to add these components around. Okay? But if suddenly Fab Academy gets extremely big, right? And suddenly uh, um, we have a uh, thousand students every year, maybe we can do a chip that's a Fab ISC chip, right? And that's everything. You maybe just need to solder a USB connector in one side, and that's all. Okay? But that's the only thing that separates us from doing so. Okay, it's not that these two things they do, um, um, they do uh, different things. Okay. So just a quick question. So what you're saying is that that, that microchip, yeah, theoretically could hold the do the same process as all those other resistors. Completely. Like right. Right. So right. Yeah. Program that microchip. Well, you could not program this one because it wasn't designed to do so. But okay. you could design a microchip. That includes the other functionalities that were not included, so you don't need to solder all these components around. And that's and that's important to understand. Uh, and why do we do it that way? Well, we do it that way because uh, the economies of scale would want to make sense to invest a lot of money in takes to design this chip, right? And that happens in public don't think that happens in the industry many times, right? Uh, you, if, even if it happens with, with, uh, with uh, cars, right? Uh, they design an engine block, right? That's common for many cars, and then it, what's around the engine is what makes it, makes the engine better or, 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 or worse, right? What makes the engine more ready for what kind of vehicle? So it's the same uh, concept.
Um, but that's important, okay? Um, okay, here is a, a little bit another hot topic always. Microcontrollers, what do these are, what do they do? It's like, okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about microcontrollers versus computers. Uh, it's still in blurry nowadays, this is great, and you will see why a little bit. So basically, okay. Uh, on the 1940s, or even before, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, the, the first ideas of how computers could look uh, um, were created. Uh, and still nowadays, and that's something, uh, well, not weird because it's kind of, it happens with many engineering core concepts, it remains the same. So that if you want to look about it, it's a one point architecture, and then there is a hardware architecture, they both like, I would say, they look pretty, pretty close one to the other. That, in fact, would be more a uh, hybrid architecture. And so, this is the concept about how a computer works, conceptually, right? Not about how, conceptually. So, uh, we have a CPU that's basically able to perform operations, but it's not able to perform always the same kind of operations. It's designed so it can do operations um, you can do, say, a set of operations based on instructions. And through instructions, it's a program, right? Uh, so basically, what we'll do is that we'll feed this set of instructions to a processor, and this processor is going to uh, read uh, some data that can be on the program itself, or can come from the keyboard, or any sort of other input. It's going to do some process, and it's going to provide you an output. But while it's doing this process, uh, it might be faster to store data because that's the same you do. I you know how many times you've been thinking and you use a piece of paper while you think and you take notes, right? Uh, and then you sit on the computer and you write a final thing. So this idea of taking notes, processing things, and this uh, we can call it which it's that the memory into it. So um, this idea of a computer built into separate blocks. So let's think about the amount of blocks that we might need on a basic computer, right? We have the processor, okay, uh, which is a central processing unit. Uh, we have uh, input devices, okay, let's think it is a keyboard, like it's really simple, right? We have an output device, um, which is a simple screen, okay. Um, I need a program. Of course, you can type the program on the keyboard, but maybe if we want to do the process again and again, it's better to have it always stored somewhere, right? So I store the program somewhere. And what I'm doing, and when I'm doing this process uh, of reading information from the program and then looking at your keyboard and then doing something and reporting it back, I need to hold the information for a certain amount of time and then I have the memory. Okay? So here might be something that would look like a hard drive, here's something that would look like a RAM, here's something that would look like a keyboard or any peripheral for input, it could be a camera too, and here was something that's the output which could be. Uh, and uh, display that could be many, many different things. So um, this, um, this concept of how a computer is built, it's really old. And the first computers that were built, uh, they really physically looked like this. So if you look at the IBM computer from the 50s or the 60s, um, they all have different set of physical blocks and each of them was doing a different functionality. So you'll have a block that was designed for really um, uh, for reading cards. So at this time, information was stored with cards and they had holes in it, right? Um, you need, uh, you need uh, inputs. You have a, a teletype, which was kind of a typewriter, but uh, they would send things as pulses and not writing letters with it. Um, you do need the central processing unit. And as you remember, this time they weren't really built using integrated circuits, so you have those discrete components, and so they were massive, right? Um, and this idea, well, I mean, it, it worked fine. Uh, um, um, in these computers, they are mostly part of mainframes. And <clears throat> the idea of them is that, of course, uh, they don't scale by adding more computers to do the same thing. They get scaled by adding more units uh, about these specific things into, into them. Um, and so, even though nowadays you could say that this looks really old, the concept about how, how they operate it's still used by us every day because most of the transactions you do in banks, every time you buy plane tickets, things like that, many of those things still happen not on these computers, but on computers that follow the same kind of architecture. 
so it's, it's nice to see how the legacy uh, still stays around. So Google don't use this kind of computers because they were, they were born in the 90s. But, computer, but companies that were born on the, before computers, they still rely on these kind of architectures most of the time because it's really efficient. And we can have a long conversation about it. So if these computers that we have, no, we may even use them now as much as before. But um, I guess all of us in the 90s had a computer that lived by this wire. You and even now in the 2000s, you open them and still inside, they have separate parts. No? So if we look at them, uh, no, I don't know how, how many computers you open, something also, as I explained, it, the IP seat for looking at their downs. I might recommend you, if you see the computer around, open it and look inside. Uh, so usually you have the central CPU, right? You will have the memory. So let's think how information flow conceptually. I mean, it is much more complex. But let's imagine that we plug our keyboard <coughs> using a USB keyboard here, right? So we are reading the data from the keyboard. And there would be in a small in a small processor here, usually not even the central one, which is dealing with the USB and these things. And this basically then, uh, it passes through the processor. It gets a story to the RAM memory here. Uh, and then the processor can request the last uh, key you type as many times as you want, that's super fast, okay? Um, but, it, but maybe then uh, it wants to store the letters so you don't lose it. Uh, so it's going to write into the hard drive here, right? And uh, suddenly um, it wants also to open the letter into the screen, okay? So it's just going to go through here. And usually it's not outputting the video directly. Usually it uses something called a video card uh, that is in a specific device for opening video that um, basically it's a processor like the one here, but more optimized for working uh, with the video data. We can talk later about this if you want. That's something that has to do with, with vectors and matrices, mostly. So you basically will be sending data here. So as you can see, all these parts are separate. And that's why the computers that we had in the 90s, even they were far more faster than those here, somehow, or at least cheaper, um, they were still boxes that were a little bit heavy. Uh, nowadays, things uh, got really tricky, uh, and we'll see later how um, um, things nowadays are mostly embedded uh, many times in the single chip. Uh, but the first time that this started to happen uh, was not to make uh, the lightest Mac Uh The first thing this thing started to happen, which was a while back ago, it was uh, um, on the idea that loop. These kind of architectures for making computers that cool, they work. I mean, we can't replace parts on the These two, right? That's pretty cool. You buy a computer like this and you can keep replacing parts. But if I want to put a computer on a car to control the airbag, if I want to put a computer inside a fridge to control the temperature and give you a large, I don't want to do that. I mean, I mean that's that's. Imagine your fridge have a hard drive inside. I mean, maybe it's cool. You can replace a hard drive when it gets old. I mean, it's good for. But you want something that's really robust. That's everything built on the same. And that's the core concept that uh, we could say in the eighties uh, gave more to the idea of microcontrol. And so, in Power Academy, we mostly will be using and learning how to code, to solder, and to deal with microcontrollers. And what a microcontroller is, really quickly, all those functionalities that you saw here on a single piece of silicon. You, you remember when a moment ago we said, oh, you build things with um, components, and then you can, if you require functionality many times, you can make a silicon part out of it. And so imagine that you have different silicon parts as here, okay, like the processor, the RAM, everything is silicon. We, we don't have like a uh, arrays of resistors. We have them inside this IP trade circuit, we have them inside this um, integrated, and so, but um, we uh, basically uh, decide, look, um, instead of having these separate pieces of ICs, we want to combine them all into the same part. And that's what you do with the microcontroller, right? So what this means, look, it means, and um, let's let's get the cake from an Arduino, okay? An Arduino will have a session in the for Arduino, what it is all the words you can buy, whatever, whole breaks of up category. So we won't be going that much into our dream today for that reason. But um, look, that's cheap. And inside, you can you set the program you want to run inside the chip. There's no hard drive right storing the program you want to run. The memory while it's running this program, so this temporary memory for storing like the numbers and the digits there, 
the processor in there to and the inputs and the outputs go directly to the outside. So when you connect a temperature sensor inside, you connect it directly here, and it goes straight to the computer. You see there's this line that goes straight to the computer. So basically what they do is to get a lot of different functionalities, and one of them is to a single piece of, of search. What, what's, what's, um, what's cool about this? Um, the cool thing about that is that, of course, you solder a single part, and you have the problem solved. So that's 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 a core component, and even if you look around an Arduino board and you see all these components around, the core things are here. So there's not this there there's not the memory around you know, these things. We know what they are, but they are things that we completely can take out. And in fact, that's the minimal things somehow that you need to put together uh, a microcontroller to work, right? So um, basically, simply that's to provide the microcontroller five volts power. So we, we even have a precise type of sort, we don't even need that. And that's a button for reset, we can completely omit, I mean, we don't need this button for reset. And that's a clock, that in fact they add the clock outside, and we can even add the clock inside. So you remember when we talk about this whole way, and where it's like adding it with precise moments of time. So we need the clock to do this actually, right? We need the clock to control the cycles every time we run something, you know, because things are not continuous. So there is a clock, but I could even use the clock inside the microcontroller. Okay, so this means at the end that I could just by placing the thing somewhere, I have enough for storing a program, reading an input, get the program to do something with this input, and have an output. Everything looks the same. What happens with microcontrollers? They were never designed somehow to do the fancy things that we do on computers. Uh, microcontrollers, visually, they have been designed to interface with a real wall. So you want them to be really fast, robust, and be able to talk directly with the peripherals to things that you will have around. So it's a bit long, this might be a sensor, a temperature sensor, a volume, a pressure sensor. And to be focused, you want to be able to control a motor, for example, right? So that's in why microcontrollers were built. And microcontrollers today, of course, are more microcontrollers than, than computers around. Because even if nowadays we all may be on a laptop and a mobile phone and maybe even a tablet, uh, still uh, we do have much more devices at home that have microcontrollers than just three. Because if you have a TV, there's more than one microcontroller inside. If you have a remote UTV has one, and the keyboard has one inside, and the USB stick has one inside, and all of these devices that we even throw away as nothing because we look at them and they do nothing, they have millions inside. Um, so, is a microcontroller and CPU the same thing? Um, no. A CPU, uh, in, let's say a CPU is a part of a microcontroller. Um, or I'm not explaining that well, but a microcontroller, since it embeds a whole computer into a single piece of silicon, uh, it includes a CPU inside it. So, usually, um, well, the problem here, and this will happen a lot in, in public housing, uh, is that uh, there's problems of terminology, right? Because there's people that will tell you, on, I saw people sometimes telling, this is a CPU, you know? Well, the CPU maybe in the green green would be the core processor, which is here, right? The center of sets of unit. And so, on a microcontroller, I'm saying, you replace all these hard drive PCB uh, hosting the, the CPU, the RAM, and everything, in a single chip. So, inside, um, a microcontroller, there's a CPU, and there's a RAM, and there's all these different uh, features. As I say, most of the microcontrollers are designed to be really fast with inputs and outputs. Okay, uh, They are not designed for storing huge amounts of information, and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see why I don't want to, to go that much into that. And that's a table that we can look once, but for you to get, to start getting to really, you know? Um, so, that's an Arduino. Okay, in order to get a 16 megahertz clock, so what does it mean that it's 16 megahertz? It means that, let's say, it means our urges are a unit frequency, right? It means that the amount of times per second something happens. Uh, sorry, for the uh, So, uh, um, the RAM basically is the amount of information that the processor has. Available. 
So uh, if, you, if you want to think, if you never look at these kind of numbers, we will get familiar. Uh, a good way of thinking about this loop. We are a library, okay? Uh, so um, we think here down is so big the library is, so many books I can explore. We think here it is um, how many books I can fit into my table. That's the size of my desk. And that would be how fast I can um, move and read into that books and move the books from the shelf into the into the table or into the table and reading them and reading the books that's right. So basically many times one of the biggest things you want is the table. Because if I can get a lot of books from the library placing them into my table and I can then start working with them, that will save me a lot of time. Because at the beginning of the action I can just put all the books I will need there and I have plenty of white paper and I can start just reading the books and them. But of course, if I'm really slow into the process of reading the books, this will also slow my process. So this thing is also important. I want you to be able to read into the books and have in the table as fast as possible. Right? And in fact, if I'm just working on a single field, uh, maybe uh, with the books I can fit on the table, it's more than enough. So I don't even need to have a lot of storage. Right? Uh, <coughs> so, a storage, hard drive. Okay, yeah? Think another way. How many empty files? Another thing about computers. How many empty, how many movies I can put into my computer? How many movies I can be playing at the same time? And uh, these two things are related. And let's say it would be how smooth they play, right? Because I can try to play a lot of videos at the same time if I have a lot of free space on my desk into my memory. But if my clock is low, I'll be able to play them. But maybe not 25 frames <coughs> per second, maybe one frame per second, right? Uh, so for you to get an idea of that, look, this is the, the this is an Arduino, right? And that's more or like less the, the, um, the, the speed and memory uh, frame that will be working mostly in the cloud We'll be using uh, um, the Arduino the chip of the Nella 328. We'll be using chip that's the uh, 8544. Nella is lower than this one, but they are more or less on the same uh, framework. So, uh, so this thing here, um, basically 16 megahertz, okay? So, um, uh, so this means uh, 16 million operations per second, right? Uh, we need to, how, yeah, how this translates to uh, speed, basically, is, um, well, we need to go quite longer than that. But, but I think it's, it's the action of doing an instruction per second, okay? Uh, the, amount, the, the, amount of, the amount of RAM, right? Uh, it's 2K, that, that's quite strong. Um, if we think that, uh, that's 2K, which means 2,000, and this is uh, and this is um, and this is one kilobyte, right? So uh, uh, if you compare an Arduino with an iPhone 6, you would see that an Arduino is far, 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 far less powerful. But we don't care because the kind of things you want to do many times they are not what an iPhone 6 wants to do. First of all, we don't want to spend the money in iPhone 6 cost every time we want to try an idea. So we want to be able to do things that we can learn or we can destroy. Second, we don't want to drive many times fancy graphics because to make a 3D printer, you don't need to have crazy megapixels and crazy devices. What you need is a system that can time precisely the motion of motors and you have a 3D printer done. So that's why you'll see, and don't get like annoyed by this, that many of the chips you'll be using, you won't drive them as fast as an iPhone uh, works, okay? However, the difference in between these two walls is getting really close. Uh, because in fact, um, do you know what a Raspberry Pi is? Have you ever like, yeah. So a Raspberry Pi, uh, if, if you compare it to an Arduino, you'll see it's far more closer to an iPhone than to an Arduino, right? And, and that's, that's incredible because um, like even 10 years ago, this wasn't like this at all. So these two things were completely separate, what a computer can do and what a microcontroller can do. Nowadays, these two things, uh, in the terms that these are two low-cost you know, uh, CPUs or, or processors or boards, um, um, is getting really close. But you shouldn't um, take as a part of thinking that this thing is still interesting. And mostly why? Or we can do a more like detailed session with that. It's basically because on the Raspberry Pi, it's super cool. We can run a full operating system on it. 
Um, but we need to run a whole operating system on it. And so that's kind of adding a lot of complexity for simple customers. Also, on the Raspberry Pi, you want to interface with the real world, like reading switches and buttons and turning motors on and off. It's not something we can do at straight on. We need to add more peripherals into it. Because you remember, we said the microcontrollers were ready to interface with the real world, while other kinds of computers were not as much designed to interface with the real world. So this means that this is still an interesting um, a tool when we want to interface with the real world with really precise timings, pretty fast, while this is more a tool that we want when we, when we want to work with video, with graphics, with things that require a lot of computing. Uh, but they are not real world in the sense that they are not talking to monitors, you know, they are talking to screens and to cameras, etc. So that's a complex topic, and we can do one one day. But I'm just saying you so you get motivated to look at these kind of things further uh, online. Uh, two questions. Yeah, sure. What is the difference between ROM and Flash? ROM and Flash. Uh, so um, this is a kind of memory. Uh, the Apollo. Uh, a store key store. This is, this is where the program is stored, right? Uh, the program or data that you need to compute. So in the Apollo imagine, right? Um, most, they, they were reading sensors uh, and they need to uh, um, perform uh, some computations on them. So this is um, this uh, store. What is stored in ROM? A ROM means read only memory. It was memory that you can just read, uh, sorry, you can just write one single time and it was there. Uh, it was safer, right? Because imagine that suddenly in the middle of the flight, the computer, uh, um, the program would get not corrupted, you know, or someone changed the program, it's better you know, to store it into a place that you cannot change. And at this time, um, the ways of storing data were really limited in the 1960s. So a ROM, let's say, uh, is like you design a memory that you can just write once and then read as many times as you want, while it was the best thing to do. So this meant that if it's like an hour before launching the ROM and they need to change the code, they uh, flash is uh, When we say CD-ROM, we use the CD-ROM, it's discard. Exactly, read only memory. Because CD-ROMs, even later, it comes the idea of a CDR, CD-ROMs were just read only memories. And in fact, inside most of the computers, now they change it a little bit, but on all these kind of classical 90s computers that we all had, right, the one that we looked before, there was also ROM that was able to boot the computer and then look for Windows or Mac OS or Linux or whatever was inside. And it was made by the manufacturer <coughs> and it was there. Okay. Uh, then at some point, they still call them ROMs, but they changed into different chips that can, as Flash or EPROMs that can be written so you can change it. And Flash basically is this new kind of memory that, um, I don't know exactly when it was invented, but it was popular around um, 15 years ago. Um, which eventually you can read and write pretty fast as many times as you want. Um, and it's made up of silicon. It's not like a hard drive where you have parts moving. Mm. Uh, and so it's really efficient and fast way to store things. And that's in a revolution, right? Because that's how mobile phones store data right now. That's how digital cameras store data and SD card. And that's how many new computers store data, right? SSDs, it's a word that's familiar to us nowadays, you know, and all that. The latest computers they have SSDs inside, which means they store the data on this kind of memory. Is there any newer technology that's sorry? Is there any newer technology to this sort of thing? I don't know. Uh, I'm not expert in that. No. Uh, I mean, sure, there's newer technologies, uh, but, but the one which is not mainstream slash. And it's important, the, 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 as you see, the Arduino inside this chip, inside the Mega 328, the same as inside the tiny. Sheets that we have on the Papa ESP, these have scratch inside, right? So it means that we can write all chips as many times as we want. Well, there's a bit, but it's not like we want. It's not like a civil law. Sorry, you know, just before you pass it, no. can you, <coughs> what was the, you use the example for RAM, how to explain RAM? Because that's well, very yeah, let's, 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 um, RAM, RAM, look. Um, so no, no, these this, this, this two things here, okay, the, way, the best way to understand these two things here is we could have a single one. It's just a matter of, of it's a limit of, it's an engineering limit, let's say. It's not a, a conceptual limit. Uh, from a concept point of view, the, uh, the, uh, we could have, an, let's say, we could have an infinite amount of memory, and this memory could contain things that we need at the moment. It can contain things that we are going to need in a year. And we could access them all as fast. 
as we want. But this is conceptual. When we land things into the real world, it happens that suddenly we discover that it's there to split things. One, a small amount of memory, fast access. One, a huge storage of memory uh, as low access. And so then basically what firms do is that you open uh, Adobe Photoshop, I go to the high drive, I get more Adobe Photoshop, I load it into my RAM, you get the image you want to edit, you fit into the RAM, the processor now can access this information super fast and you can start getting information in out and processing things. Okay. So the more RAM you have, the more things you can process at the same time. That's the only cost you need to keep on. The more RAM you have, the more things you can do uh, at, the, at the same time. We felt having to remove what's on the RAM, putting back in the high drive, and then the next slide. The controller for the script in the microprocessor, or the external memory controller? The memory controller is inside the microprocessor. Because that's that sense, in the microcontroller, by default, everything, all those critical computer parts that even if we don't know that much about computers, we all have in mind, like the memory, the processor, the storage, all this is inside. Then you can expand it by adding new things around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, quick question. So, is all the memory is it based on electric, electrical inputs? And is it what sort of physically? Yeah. What sort of um, transition do we have between? Uh, no, sir, yeah, to a to a not quite. Is it all electrical? Well, um, all these, all all, all these, all these. Um, Let's say we can, there's, there's two big groups in the way we sort things, uh, and I'm not a specialist on that at all. But one is, uh, one is what we use uh, silicon for things. So, so flash, uh, modern ROMs, modern ROMs, all these works like SSDs as flash, all these processes work on silicon. So inside it look pretty much the processor. It's just an amount of transistors that they are designed in a way that even if you remove power from it, they can keep the state, right? Uh, there's always for storing data as on a hard drive, which is stored by writing, uh, by basically changing the magnetic charge on a piece uh, of metal uh, and their state, which follow more or less the same concept, but the case is moving, it's not a plate, so that's a bit slower. Uh, and there's many more ways, right? And if we move into the CD, which stores with light, right? It's basically a scattering, a small, uh, Scanning the, the, the surface uh, of the of the um, of the CD in a way that light affects differently, so it's a one or it's zero. Uh, so there's many ways, but mostly nowadays, all these uh, inside, in fact, all those computers, the only thing that stores data is all silicon. Uh, and so, um, and so silicon, let's say, would be in a flash form or in a round form. That's engineering. It's not, let's say, it's not a cancer, right? It's just that the idea that. Uh, the RAM is designed for uh, fast access, uh, small amount of information. The flight is designed for big data volumes, uh, as low uh, access. So, um, what what's um, what's happening now? Well, uh, this is a nice uh, table, and we can discuss it more another day. But it compares all the different functionalities against uh, all the different boards available. Uh, in terms of microcontrollers and small computers like the Raspberry Pi, things that people like us uh, oh. might like to, to play with them. So, uh, arrived to that point, okay? Uh, as you see, now we keep going into all these topics and then from our classes we'll expand them. So, um, software. Um, okay, the uh, reason that we talk about firmware, but there's something else called uh, operating system. And so what's different between one or the other? So, um, let me, yeah. So basically, on, uh, talking about perfect systems, and talking about uh, how you code, uh, and the idea of what software is on hardware, that, that could be like a really long uh, talk. So uh, I prefer if you have specific questions as we are doing, that you, you, you jump uh, into me. So, um, basically, on, uh, on big computers, on powerful computers, where computing power is not a problem, uh, we usually uh, do something which is really uh, much convenient, which is to create something which is an operating system. 
a water operating system. An operating system, yeah, even when we think about an operating system, we think about Microsoft Windows and Mac OS, and so we think of a graphical interface. And that's not uh, an operating system by default. An operating system is just a bunch of code that runs um, into our hardware and basically abstracts the functionalities that we need to do really often. This way, the applications which are on top don't need to know that precisely how the hardware works. The operating system just manages for them. Also, when you want to run two or three or more tasks simultaneously, uh, the operating system will take care of telling each application when it needs to run. So it's basically a way of abstracting so we can write applications faster. So when you write the application, and you'll be doing so in Tabacana, uh, in Python, or in processing, and you want to save an image into the bits, you don't need to know how this works. The, very, the program really just provides you, at the language, a way of saying, save this image, and then this, that's what's called a system call, which is by calling the operating system and saying, look, I want to save this, and exposes a way of saving the image. So you don't need to know about the bits and bytes if you're using hard drive or USB stick. All those things are mapped into uh, the same way, right? And it's really cool. Huh? And that's why operating systems are cool. For this and for multitasking. So at some point in computers, they realize that um, you could do things simultaneously, right? If you have a processor which is that fast, um, and you write it just to see 24 frames per second, uh, I mean, while I'm not showing you a picture, I can be doing other things, right? And still you feel that things are going in parallel, super cool. And so uh, these things, right? You computer that things in parallel, as I showed you a video and, and playing a MPP file at the same time, or let's or write or writing an article in, or whatever you do, is not because it has many computers inside. It does this by using the same processing unit by Basically, doing one task and then another and then another and then another and then another, and it shows to you in a way right, that you feel that things are really going to the same time. And sometimes, no, I can find some crash. Some things, oh no, no, these two things were going at the same time. So, this is also part of the class, right? Operating system. Three main operating systems we all should know, and, and, and it's uh, Windows, Mac OS X, and Mostly Linux. Say Mostly Linux, why? Because that's the one that you get a little bit into in Top Academy. And Linux is open source, so it means that you can really um, think of it um, as a tool for making things. Uh, so uh, I really encourage you, I know there's a lot to do in Pop Academy, but if you have some time, go on the waiting side and it's well. It's really cool. And the best way to do so, I would say, and we'll talk later, is by getting into a library. <coughs> Fireware. Firmware, it means, uh, again, these things are concepts. I mean, it's not a different programming language, but you use for one or the other. It's everything to the concept of. Firmware, it means we run, uh, it's what we refer when we have code that runs usually directly into the hardware, right? This means that the code knows from the code itself how to drive into the disk. And so if the memory is flash, as we are saying, or the memory is a hard drive, the firmware needs to be completely changing. Uh, where do we find firmware? In microcontrollers. In microcontrollers, we know that if we try to drive a full OS inside the microcontroller, because it's not that fast, uh, we'll end up that we won't be able to run We won't be able to run it on the microcontroller. So that's why, usually, we write things directly on the firmware. So, when we are writing an Arduino sketch, right, to read the temperature sensor and play some light, uh, what we are doing is just write a firmware, right? This means that all the system is under all control. When we launch the Arduino, it will launch our firmware. There's no good time, like a computer. It's going to start, and we won't need the OS layer to get ready. We won't need all this layer here to get ready. As soon as we start, boom, the firmware is there, and that's what we want. Well, you could say, oh, yes, OSs are really cool. Yeah, it's really fast, in a way, right? It's really fast because it means that you turn the Arduino on, uh, and that's why your card is into boot. Right? I mean, you carry it from microcontrollers and you turn it on, etc. Right? You get a 3D printer, you open it, you turn it on, you need to do it, etc. Okay? It's really robust, you need to do it in that way. However, since microcontrollers are getting more and more powerful, uh, it's true that every time it's more normal to run an OS. Not uh, Windows, not Mac, maybe Linux, or even other small OSs that uh, have different names like real time OS. There's a whole family of the small uh, operating systems were embedded in things. Uh, 
Uh, so you don't need to write how you access the disk, how you access the memory, how you do all the features. At least it's built on the back. Um, that's much more convenient for multitasking. And so, find with things, and just to conclude that, as I say, on microcontrollers, and if you want to look at your own wall and you can find words, mostly uh, your router uh, uh, is running maybe, well, routers usually at home usually, sometimes they run on Linux, but some also run their own kind of find word, which is maybe an OS, but it's not uh, that it's um, And so, all these small bits of code that we have inside the keyboard, notes, et cetera, are kind of, right? We don't need to run a full uh, OS. And so, um, that's a little way in fact to differentiate what we do on a Raspberry Pi and what we do on an Arduino. And I'm going to talk about this often uh, when we talk those days because a Raspberry Pi is something that uh, it's really convenient for certain tasks and Arduino for others. And nowadays there's a, a lot of confusion. You know? It's like, why well, we don't use a Raspberry Pi for everything? Why well, we don't use Arduino for everything? You know? So, um, Raspberry Pi is not powerful. We can run it through the loops inside. Arduino. We write Finder free, we don't run it to OS. Cool thing about Raspberry Pi, as we run on OS, there's tons of things not for Linux, so we don't have to write them again. Okay? Cool thing about the Arduino, we don't need to learn the complexity of Linux. You know? We just write what we want to do. You know? and, and, and I think when we learn things in life, we all agree that many times one of the things that frustrate us is that to do something, we need to learn all those complexities that we don't like. And that prevents us from being creative on things we want to build. Uh, so that happens into many software. People say, oh, you know, like, I don't know, like, uh, please do your max, what a, what a mess of software, you know, they have to learn like thousands of things to make the user outcome, you know. And then you compare it with software which is much easier than just Rhino or Cinema 4D. It's like, oh, that's super cool. Um, so this thing happens, and, 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 and it happens also in your coding. So the cool thing about your review is you write firmware. Replace, you compile, you put inside, and it works. If the light is not turning on, you don't need to start on inside the operating system, which maybe it's running with code, but then there's something that prevents from running because your user doesn't have a permission to run, so you don't have this problem, right? Uh, oh, I want to do things at the same time, in Arduino, to complex tasks. Oh, I need to code myself. Look away, it's a loop. Here are two sketches. Run this one, run this one, and run this one. Okay? Also, Cool things about six-party systems. Look, I want to play with video. Uh, Raspberry Pi had already drivers for the cameras, whatever, I plug in USB stick, driver for USB stick there. I don't need to write things on C, I can write things on Python, I can write things on languages which are much more easier. You know? And that's a cool thing. You know? So we'll be going around it, but so at least now you get a little bit of these ideas. Okay, compiling. Um, that's something that you will be doing this week, right? Uh, you will be building this board, and once you have the board, you are going to get a file that contains a code for the software you see to run. And you'll get this code, and you'll basically um, journey it into instructions the microcontroller, the ITI core core inside that understand. And so that's really important because um, the cool thing about what we are talking today is that we are not talking about analog electronics. Uh, we are talking about digital electronics, and so we are talking about computers, in particular microcontrollers, which means things that we can program, and that's pretty cool. That means that the functionalities that we can do is open to us. It includes outputs, process, the process can be whatever we want. That means that we need to write support for them, uh, and there's different ways of writing code uh, for this kind of chips. Um, usually, for microcontrollers, the default standard is to use C or C++. Uh, why? Because this language it's really much, was really much designed uh, for uh, talking in, for, let's say, well, how we'll describe it, because it wasn't like this at the beginning. Uh, let's say, um, nowadays, if you read a little bit, you know a little bit about what C means or C++ means, it's like, oh, the super old school thing, which is super high performance, you write very systems and get into it because the thing that goes fast. In fact, C wasn't designed uh, to be this. C, when it was born, was designed to be like this, let's say. But when it was born, was a cool thing because it came from a time that languages were still much tied to different machines that were running. And what does this mean? It means that IBM will do a machine, a computer, the size of a group, and will create a particular 
language both Ryan and Shin, and you as employees of Tamla will be going to IBM, they will teach you for the language to work, and then 10 years later we'll change the machine and you'll learn a different language to write for this machine. And so these were languages specifically designed to talk to this hardware. And if you add two hardware, then you have two different instructions, one to talk, you know, it's one hardware, one to the other, and, and where we like this. So C was really a bad at this time. But it's true that for um, current standards, it's blue white blue all and so all school language because it's not magic. I mean, you really have to think what you are doing all the time. But even though it's really powerful, and it makes sense to learn not in the sense of mastering it, but to getting familiar with it. Uh, and a good thing to do so is that the Arduino runs a subset of, of C groups, say, well, not even a subset of C. The Arduino basically uses libraries to simplify the way C. Uh, it's used when you write software for a microcontroller. Okay? Yes, yeah. uh, I thought that the Arduino was written on top of Java. So, that's a good question. Um, and this is a big confusion that happens all the time, and I love you mentioning that because I don't know how introduced to that. And the thing is, but it, it will introduce that because you see, a word here I'm using is tool chains. What a tool chain means? A tool chain is. So, if you think of it, it's really absurd. You know, it's like you write code and then you put it into a thing like this, and it's cynical. It's like, what, what do you think it is? So, of course, this process of translating this into that takes some process. And this process implies different steps. And these steps, usually, we call them the tool chain. The tool chain means uh, all those steps that you put together to turn. This code into something that you can run. It's completely cheap, you can do it. For Arduino, one of the things that did, more people think that what Arduino did was creating a completely new language. No, not saying. Basically, we'll go into it day and one day, but basically, they just created a subset, not subset, they created a set of libraries. I know something will be like They created a set of libraries um, that allow that when you are writing things, uh, to talk to your things that make sense or things easier. So you see how to write this, to read the, if uh, a button is pressed or no, and they basically got all these functionalities and create a simple function that's called this or read, and has all these functions. But it's, it's okay. The, once you solve this problem, it's like, I can write the code faster. That's cool. I mean, you know, like, this is the code that you need to make an algorithm leap or not. And if you write it on C, it's a little bit longer. So that's cool, it's easier to learn. But still, if I want to put this code inside, I will need to compile this code, I will need to flash it inside. So to simplify this process, they create something called an ID. An ID basically is a software that you run an application, that you run your computer as you run a Photoshop or Word or whatever application you like, that's able to do this process, right? It takes the code, it compiles it, and it also took the chip to flash it. So, Arduino wrote the thing in Java. So it means the application, this thing where it's like a text, uh, like text editor, right? You write text inside, it has a button when you press this code, it's on the back, some tools for compiling this and turn it to a language the chip can understand. This thing was written on Java, but you code it. So, in fact, Java Arduino has to do that, the, the software they develop to uh, talk to the chief before in Java. But in fact, you can talk to an Arduino, uh, or you can flash an Arduino and compile software for an Arduino using uh, um, many different tools, not just in Java. So uh, the thing is, that Java would be like, you somehow as, as no way too much noiters, example, have in mind, but it's a little clear. But yeah, separation between Java, because no, it, it's so it's true. The truth is that if, you, if I gave you the application, so that's Arduino. And you can say Arduino exists. Well, this is written on Java. But that's not Arduino. Arduino is neither the programming language. Arduino is neither that. Arduino is the whole project that develops these ways for interfacing to these uh, chips. And the language you write is C. The software used for writing language is written on Java, but there's many things. And in fact, now you'll see that there's not just this ID, there's many new. And so, I'm referring to the thing as IDE. It's a really horrible word. It's Integrated Development Environment. But that's so um, technically, 
you call these text uh, nodes, these text elements, these uh, softwares, where you write code and you have certain patterns that automatically uh, compile the software, check for errors, and send the software. It could be into an Arduino, you might do that still with web pages, so they send the software to the server, and the server does the thing, you know, uh, whatever it is. Quick question. How, how many times can you flash or program a you know, later? Yeah, exactly. You don't need to flash. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's true. This is not, it is, it is, it is on, on RAM, on a flash. Yeah. Uh, and so if you want to click on that, you'll see. Um, USB sticks and LSD hard drive, and they are continuously moving the information inside their memory. I mean, not when you have them on a drawer, but when you plug them to the computer, or if they are inside, in order that all the transistors inside, they got the same usage. Because they know that if the things you're always writing this word file all the time, you'll end up just uh, crushing a part of, the, of your memory. Because Flash has a limited amount of reads and writes, as a limit, let's say. But the one of Flash is not as long as all the mediums, I think. But I'm not, I'm not an expert in that, so. Uh, this is really technical, and I don't want to get crazy into that feature, okay? But uh, that's what's called tool chain. And you will be playing with the tool chain in space. Uh, it's what I'm explaining to you. So we'll look then at the tool chain of the Papa ISP for a moment, quickly. But the concept here is this. Let's do it on the Arduino wall, okay? That's a little bit easier to understand maybe at the beginning. I'm going to write a file which has extension .in, which is set up in the instruction to the Arduino language. Look for Arduino sketch, it's full of the internet. I'll get this, and this is going to be compiled, or this, this we get the end of this, I'm going to write these things that make it uh, a C, so these libraries. I don't want to spend that much time on that. Then we're going to get these and turn it into the instruction set that the chip understands. So this process here is specifically uh, done for the chip, right? If this code, we want to run it on a different chip, we'll need to change this, okay? So that's a beauty when I say about C. You remember, know, start saying like, well, C now looks a little bit old, but it was quite modern in its time, and that's why C is also called modern, because um, it's not designed just for a specific chip. Uh, and so um, we can um, we can move this code to other chips and to other architectures. We can learn about this later. But there's a process that turns this into something we did specific just from the chip, which is so, something called instruction set. This is basically the instruction that the silicon thing understands. Okay. So the silicon thing has a set of functions that can operate. Let's imagine an example of, a, of, a, of a, an instruction. Adds. It adds two things, right? Uh, <clears throat> so we can look even at machine code once we want to see how these things work. When we arrive here, all this happens inside our computer. But there's a point here that we need to transfer this into another machine, right? And here is where it goes. Uh, the let's say the topic about 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 uh, not about today, but I think one of the hot topics of, of today. So, um, we have the next file, code inside, we compile this code for a specific chip, we have it compiled, but then we have it in our computer, and we want to put it inside our computer, right? If we compile something for a computer, let's imagine you are working on developing, you know, like, um, a new, um, uh, whatever applications, you, you, are, you are working and you, you are working in Adobe Photoshop, right? And you are writing Adobe Photoshop, you are writing new features you do. And so you're doing Photoshop, you're doing Beam, or you know, like Inkscape, let's talk about, you're using Inkscape, not so in Inkscape. Well, you do some changes like, look, I don't like that, uh, the way you're selecting the path for that way, well, I don't know the source, the change, oh, I like it, well, I compile, and because it runs in my computer, I end up here, it compiles, I, it opens as a new application into my laptop, right? And I can see, oh, it looks cool. It changes like, good. No, 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 let's change it. Good. Fine. Here we are talking most of the time about microcontrollers. So we program your laptops. We don't program into the microcontrollers because these chips, they don't have keyboards, right? We don't connect into the Arduino, write the code there. We use our super nice computer, you know, to edit the code. 
We compile it, and then when it's compiled and it's ready for the thing to be uh, working, we send it into the thing, right? And these questions that we send into the thing, it's what usually we call flashes. So, um, we call it flashing because it comes from the, from the time that, um, I think so, I mean, I, I, I wasn't even bored in this time, so I don't know exactly what it worked, but um, if I'm fine, if I'm right, uh, EEPROM memories, uh, which is still in use, but all EEPROM memories, um, the way um, the way you erase them uh, was by applying uh, light into them. So these memories, you know, the man the chief made of silicon, in fact, there's maybe even something that had a hole, and on this hole you would apply light, and by applying light, it would erase the memory, and then you can worry again. So, uh, so that's why the word flashing came. And flashing basically means, okay, we have this code in our computer, it's the one that needs to run on this small, tiny machine inside my board, and it put it there. Okay. And so, the boards that will be really a pattern, they don't have hard drive, they don't have a port for USB sticks, a port for uh, SD cards. So we need a way to put the software inside. And here is where it comes the idea of a program. So the path ISP is a program, something that allows us a code that we created in our computer to place it inside a chip. Okay. Uh, you will see that later we can do something called bootloader, so we don't need to program. But that's another thing. So let's quickly, and a way to get a little bit more how the fat ISP would work. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, here we have um, So, here we have a full board that we designed that has a button and an LED and has a microcontroller inside. Forget about everything else that works in ma like magic. And when we press the button, we design a code that when you press the button, does something and then does something with the LED. So we want that every time you press the button, uh, the LED will do five minutes and then it's fine. Okay, it's fine. We um, created the code in our computer, okay, and we wrote it. That's on C++, uh, or uh, on C++, or any uh, language that uh, we like, the Arduino, that's not some, something we need to worry about. Um, okay, we compile it, okay. So we think now it's a file in your computer, which is ready to be put inside a chip. Okay. That chip here is the kind of chip that we use to build a camera. It's not tiny or important. I need to put this binary file here, okay? That's my laptop. Okay? That's nice to you. So, why do you this there? I mean, Let's look at look at the laptops. I mean, you have uh, you have uh, look, let's look at this laptop. You have SD card, HDMI, USB, another USB. No, Thunderbolt, right? Two Thunderbolt ports, another USB. I mean, we can kind of talk with the USB, with the Thunderbolt, with the Ethernet, with the any of those protocols. When there is nothing inside the chip it can just solve a protocol that was defined by the manufacturer, right? And this protocol, um, it can, uh, it's a protocol that all computers can talk. So how we do it, how we throw it away, there's nothing to do, no, it's like, um, this is the end of the world. So, um, no, we can create something called a parameter, which will be like a bridge in between our computer and this chip. So we can program the chip. And so what we're going to do, we are going to create the board 
that's the one side has USB. We have USB here, right? So USB on laptop, right? USB on that or uh, on this board. And then this board needs to translate the information into a protocol this can understand. Okay. And so we have here a connector. And here we'll place the connector. This connector, we are always going to connect it to some pins inside this microcontroller, right? And then with this control here, we'll be able to send this binary file into or a small chip here, okay? That protocol here depends on the kind of chip we use, okay? For uh, the chip we're going to use, we're going to use something called um, well, let's use serial circuit grammar, and that uses something which is sort of weird, it's like kind of a, it's kind of a mixture of SPI and something else. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a report. Um, in order to convert USB into, uh, into the protocol that this thing understand, okay, uh, we can go and go to bgp.com and buy a programmer, okay, that's commercial, you can buy it, I mean, you go and buy a programmer, uh, there's a Admiral, something called the Admiral ICE, and there's many more, you can go buy one, that's all. But look, that costs money, it's completely closed source, so if it breaks, you don't know how to fix it. Uh, why do you don't make one yourself? And that's a top ABC. So, that thing here, and serial circuit So, the thing here is what the FAP ASP is. And so, how you, how you do this? Uh, how you make this? Well, we place a chip here, which is the same chip as we have here, but it doesn't need to be the same chip, okay? In this case, it's a coin somehow. Well, it makes sense. I mean, the fewer chips we have, the better, right? So we learn how to work with one chip, and that's fine. So, that's an RT44 chip, right, here. And we'll place, um, in this case, the same chip. But as I'm saying, that's not, that's not important at all. So the concept here is, we'll place the chip. And using another device like this, that we need to have, if we are alone in the middle of an island, we cannot do this thing, okay? Uh, we'll get this FabISP thing, we'll flash it with a binary file that contains the instructions about how to read the USB and turn this USB protocol into something which you can understand. And so we can set a binary file from here. So, the process that we are going to follow, first of all, um, well, of course, let's say, let's make it simple. We have, uh, we have this, we have this fat thing, okay? Right? Then, we have, uh, or laptop here, okay? We'll get another one like this. We'll connect them from a USB. We'll connect this here. And we'll program this, okay? We'll program this. This thing now is going to, so, okay? We have a code that someone created, not us. It's a code that's really well done, that's able to get this chip on this board, which is a tiny 44. It's a black one. Let's, let's look at, at the... And we're close to finish, guys. Okay, so we'll get, we'll get the chip that you see here, right? Uh, and we'll run it with a code that's able to be a bridge between USB and the SCPI protocol that uh, our chip needs to be run, okay? 
So the first time, what we need to do is to program this black chip here to be able to do this functionality. So what you'll do, and Santi, <coughs> you'll explain you that you'll get your computer, you'll use an existing, okay? You'll use an existing um, Papa ASP, and we'll load the code into your <coughs> Papa ASP. So two boards that look the same, one talking to the other. Right? This one was already programmed, it knows how to go from USB and talk to that chip, so I grab the chip. Fine. Now I have <coughs> my own FAP ISP, right? And I can create any code that one, connect it over USB. And that's not for programming other Papa ISPs because, well, I can do it if I want, but that's not the point of it. No. Then, in the future, I can create my own boards with buttons, with lights, with whatever I want, and I'll be able to program it. Sorry. Good question. The, so the FAB ISP, is that the one looks exactly it's the same board that we're actually going to be programming? It's the same. Except it's programmed to read the USB rather than program whatever different type of. Um, uh, uh, so, so the FAB ISP that we need to flash, right? To read our USB from the computer. Yeah. It's the same, it looks exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's exactly the same one that yeah. we then use again. Exactly. To exactly. Program Look. Um, yeah, if you, you refer to the, the red ones, it's the same as the yeah, red one, one except the program. Yeah, so yeah. they are all the same. Well, we could use other things. Eh? I mean, this, let's say, we uh, um, I am creating a public in Iceland in the middle of the Pacific. I don't have, uh, I need to start some way. Well, I will call a person and I pop it to my SP, I will go there, or I can buy, and I can buy a commercial one. And this could be a commercial one, that's the only difference. In fact, and just to be too low, you could even use an off-the-shelf Arduino board as this. So you can use an off-the-shelf Arduino board, put some software inside the board that makes it perform as this, yeah. and then use it to program this. So okay. it was Exactly, you would want to start. Uh, why? Because our computer cannot talk this uh, protocol. We have, it can, um, in fact, just to know as a university, all computers that had the thing called a parallel core, you remember as kids, you had printers at home over the USB. They were connected with the connectors that had like, not so many, 25 pins? I don't remember. But a bunch of them. So, um, computers that they had still, they have still this kind of interface. In fact, those here they have it. Um, you can um, directly create this protocol. Uh, so, you don't need this. This means that you have, a, you have an old computer and you can have the right of the chip, which is cool. And I think, and just without thinking, that often and often we'll need to, to, start, to start doing this kind of thing. Why? Because computers, uh, they have less peripherals you know, every time. And like, um, um, peripherals are kind of more modern, you know, like HDMI, like, uh, like uh, Thunderbolt. Um, at the same time, it's true that microcontrollers like, keep getting better and better. And, Things at a time more easier to run than using different, uh, different, um, <coughs> sorry. Is this the only program and other I'm planning for the board or any one? It's, uh, the way it's designed is, uh, I'm not an expert exactly how they design it on the, on the software, but it's compatible to use all the family of, uh, um, any R, Chips from Admin. So, Admin is a company, uh, a big one. In fact, it's not anymore a company because it got acquired by Microsoft. Uh, Admin has a company of chips called ABR. ABR were super cool and new chips, maybe 15 years old or more. They were some of the first chips that the whole toolchain, all this process that you have to do, was open source, so you really need to pay a fee to them for doing them, and they had flash inside. Um, these are the chips that are most used in Papa Academy, the Tiny, 44, 45, 
84, 85, the never so once I'm going to run it, uh, so never uh, 338, the never 322, 324. So all the family mostly of arguably of words of 325, it can be programmed using, uh, they are from this AVR family, and so it can be programmed in the family at this point. Um, for other new families of chips, as for example, um, NRM chips, the family of chips that runs uh, on um, phones and it runs a Raspberry Pi, etc. There's different ways of running them, and it's not so good. It will be a simple. So, yeah, a lot of chips are programmed. Exactly, exactly. This is where, and with this I finish because it is getting really, really long, and I'm sorry because it's like, man, it's the last thing that we talked today. So, if we look at an Arduino, we see that we have USB here. And you'll see when you start playing with the Arduino, uh, that on the Arduino, when you buy one commercially, you don't need this. You can start connecting it to the USB and the memory from the USB doing this process. Somehow, as the FAT ISP was built in onto the Arduino, you know? And that's cool, because you buy an Arduino, and with a single thing, not with two things, with a single thing, you can flash uh, the board. Why this is possible? That's possible. Uh, I don't have an image for that, but it's fine. Um, that's possible because there's something inside of a good loader. And um, you, um, you'll see this word, you'll listen to this word pretty much. And here, uh, let me just. So, nothing about this. Something that you do on our even chips, and we've done in the industry many times, is a concept of a boot loader. A boot loader means, imagine, um, this is our chip, okay? Um, this is the chip inside, so the big black thing that we have here, right? Um, what I can do is that I can create a small piece of software that is always going to stay here inside and knows how to start a thing. Okay? Bootloaders can do many different things. What it does on the Arduino is basically you load this piece of code here using the same process as we described here. Okay? But then We create this piece of code so we can read whatever comes from the USB and put it to fit this area here. So basically, this is telling look, every time this is a new thing, okay, it's a software that runs inside the chip. And we load it using this process here, which was done on the factory, okay, automated. The room goes there, the room goes there, okay, fine. Then I have a home, I connect it over USB, and this thing tells me I'm a USB device. What tells you it's a USB device is this thing here. Then this thing here, basically, what we do is that say, say, look, everything you receive over USB, feed it onto the other memory that we have. You know? So if we imagine the flash memory of the chip as a bunch of, let's say, switches, you know, Basically, we program the first set of thousand switches to be able to read the USB, get whatever other stream of ones and zeros arrive, and place it into the other side of the memory, into the next 10,000 switches. And this, that, and then start. And when you start again, you have this side of the memory filled with 10,000 switches that they have a program inside, right? You might learn something, and that's what it happens. Uh, Bootloaders are really common, and in fact, we are everywhere. Well, uh, bootloaders are limited to USB. There's bootloaders that can work over the internet, for example. And that's why, uh, for example, there's, uh, there's routers, you know, the whole, you know, for, uh, for fiber optics and VSL, that they can be flashed remotely. So they have a, a small piece of software running always inside, and then they can flash them remotely, change the whole code. Uh, and that happens a lot, a lot. Even the bootloader can do much more things. Uh, if you think how you design a super complex signboard, for something which is super critical, like something on a camera, can fail. You can design a bootloader 
to be monitoring the software. So if the software does something wrong, you can just, for example, decide that you stop the software and the bootloader just switch back to the previous version. These kind of things. So bootloaders can be really complex and do like a lot of complex things. And the last thing, so, so you don't get into contradictions, um, the Arduinos, there are some that they can talk directly to USB. There are some that the that, that bootloader is not talking directly to USB, it's talking serial, which is a, 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 a let's say, a more, a more old school protocol. And then there is another chip that does the conversion to USB. But let's say conceptually it's the same, okay? Just we don't get confused. There are some other chips uh, that I use on here, you know, Leonardo and other boards. You'll be using them on the back of the you know, uh, it's called the Antenna Purpose Group, for example, etc. And no chips like a top name is USB, if they have a loader. So we flash a loader with a Papa ISC to here, bull loader goes inside, the chip can talk maybe USB. Fine. There's other chips a little bit older, like the Mega 338, this one here, which that kind of talk directly uh, USB. So again, as we do with the Papa ISC, we need a bridge. In this case, it's not a bridge between um, between uh, uh, USB and this uh, ISC protocol. It's a bridge between uh, USB and serial. And this, and there we don't use serial here. Uh, so one day we will talk about more serial and peripherals and protocols because that's something that has like keeps coming and it's difficult to get a little bit better than the other. So I know we talk a lot. For me, it's uh, I mean I'm, I, I, I stop talking. Time for questions. Are you so, any questions, please? You need cigarettes, coffee? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, there turns a lot to, me, to, to go over, but, and I know that for this week, the good thing is I need to stop uh, here. Okay, so this, forget about it. Many of the things we discuss it go for the next four weeks. Uh, we now, model, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interaction. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Before a uh, question, before I move on and, and this, uh, yeah. when people were playing DIY, <laughs> and, and this, uh, the, big, the big platform at the time was, and it's still a big platform. Uh, Look, uh, I can show you. Uh, so, uh, we did a quick idea. Uh, so this this was the big family from Microchip. This is a big uh, family on the industry. I would say, I don't know the, the I mean, any other the popular text for you know, but before the big family was, and it's still interesting, yeah, like it's really, really powerful. Many people in the industry like the music. And so uh, the big family was the one that most people use. I mean, to be clear, ABR and Atmel chips existed before the However, before, uh, uh, so what was there before, even before ABR chips and animal chips, which started on the, in England, I would say, was PIC. PIC is from microchip, uh, and um, they have similar tools as Arduino for coding for them, right? Uh, the critical thing about PIC is that the tool chain, so the software, is closed source. So it's like Photoshop. You pay it or you get it back somehow. But imagine that every, for each of you, we need to pay a license, you know, of thousand euros to run this. And that that's that really stops, right? Even if the code that you make you can flex it over and say GitHub, if what you need to compile the code to make it useful because you want thousand euros, that's stop. And just based on what you say, and so we get the framework, I'm I'm saying all the time you have ABR chips, you have admin chips on, on, on cars, you know, you have admin chips on elevators. You don't call the chip in your real There's no way of coding for that chip. Uh, you can go, of course, on the C++, and uh, you can do, you can uh, use, um, you can use uh, different tool chains. And you will use the basic tool chain, which is called Make, which is uh, the, the basic unit for 
making tool chains on, 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 on Unix systems. But you can also use Admiral Studio, for example. It's, a, it's kind of a full-fledged interface to code for Admiral Studio. Mostly people were at this time, the tasks would be, they state it to be, and they were much, much more difficult because people were sharing two other services. And so that's why I really started. Because uh, they were getting like things and just like, they were trying to teach like students how to make these things. Uh, and to do, you know, like a full course just to explain how the basics work. And so there was no time for GT. And that's why when Arduino was born in, in, in Rare and Italy, like, like uh, they were teaching design students that were something fast, you know, and, and, and it's like that. And you still have to do the same process of tool chain and, and flashing. Oh, you want to on the bits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I never worked on bits, but I know many people that work on Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Of course, the same. Yeah. The same for, yeah, all the microcontrollers. Uh, at the end, and, uh, even, even on the Raspberry Pi, it's not going to take them. Same, even in the computer, yeah. there are some problems on the factory that involve this. Yeah. So then it can move the spec from the USB. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So for your laptop to be able to win from a USB, there's something running inside, which is not the OS, but the OS has a little bit. You want to boot the OS. Yeah. So there's some kind of tool chain uh, that was used to compile and flash uh, something inside your computer if that's able to do this. Well, uh, yeah. That's all. Thank you. Uh, well, so, yeah, by the way, yeah, many, of the things uh, I, many of the things I say, as I said at the beginning, yeah, they are really to make things understandable. Don't make it like, okay, that's grand, that's like this. Because that's, I mean, in this 